Thank you, Daniel. Welcome, everybody, to a civil rights case against the police. Actions attorneys take before filing the complaint at law. Today is June 4th, 2020, and I am David Lipschultz. I'm in the surreal setting of my home to give her, uh, to provide this webinar, participate in the webinar with you, and I'm staring at a wall. I cannot guarantee that a child will not pop up from his homeschooling and appear in the background. I can promise, however, that nobody naked will be running behind me as I hear it is happening across the world in this day and age of Zoom. First, I want to thank our generous sponsors, Illinois Legal Aid Online, the Chicago Bar Association, Civil Rights Committee, and First Defense Legal Aid. In particular, I want to thank Daniel Masalia of First Defense, Marcin Gulick, and Amy Clark of Illinois Legal Aid Online, and Jeff Grossich of the Chicago Bar Association's Civil Rights Committee. Thank you very much for your extra attention, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The agenda. Uh, I think you have it in front of you in your materials and on the screen. Um, you know what happens when a lawyer starts speaking, uh, schedules get thrown out the window. I will do my best to adhere to those schedules and uh, keep things moving. So to begin with, part of why this was a uh, interesting subject for me to address in a webinar is that I find uh, early investigations, pre-litigation investigations, to be fun and enormously effective. And I'm not bragging on this uh, slide. I literally have won cases simply because of discoveries that I've made before I ever filed suit. Might have been a, a, a vital witness that nobody knew about. It might have been a uh, videotape from a store shop camera that nobody bothered uh, sending a letter of preservation to and obtaining. And it might be an officer's disciplinary history, either generally or a particular incident within the history that might be related uh, directly or under, uh, indirectly to your defendants. A disclaimer I am not the guy who gives. Um, all letter law A through Z. Um, I consider myself a color commentator uh, today. I, my presentation is not designed to be an exhaustive list of all pre-litigation actions. Instead, I'm sharing my considerations of various actions that I take on a regular basis. Most importantly, every case requires its own elements, its own actions. Let's begin, um, let's begin with the initial client communications and meetings. Building trust. I pause to say what you all know, which is that we are living in most extraordinary times in this country and in this world. First, we were hit with COVID-19, massive uh, health problems, death, illness, suffering economic um, slide, and then uh, we have uh, blood on the streets of America with uh, police misconduct uh, being exposed and racial injustice being exposed. The reason I talk about this uh, historic moment is because of what I'm presenting with regards to building trust. When you meet your client, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that your client comes from a world other than yours. Um, most of my clients have grown up in communities where uh, they are denied uh, justice, where they are denied access to uh, the economy, uh, to culture. And it's an awkward first meeting because uh, the attorney and the client are coming from such different worlds. My recommendation to you, as soon as you meet with a potential client or client, is to spend time with them on the phone. And when you first meet, get to know them, learn about their life history, their family history, 
share some of your experiences. These are communications that all of us uh, need to have, not only in attorney-client meetings, but in fact, if this country is ever going to recover from 400 years of uh, slavery and Jim Crow and inequality, uh, we're all gonna have to start speaking with each other with kindness and gaining an understanding um, into each other's lives. It's particularly important with your clients because you need to know, uh, you need to have their trust so that you can learn all of the details of their case. Sell yourself, not to brag, you don't wanna brag in these meetings or at all, but you wanna sell yourself because many of our clients have never met with attorneys before. They don't know the questions to ask. And you should lead them through questions. Why should they hire you? Explain your experience as an attorney. How many cases have you litigated? What fields of law have you practiced in? Uh, why should they pick you over uh, another attorney? Um, and it's also a chance to uh, begin explaining the possible outcomes of the, of the case. Explain the stages of litigation. I often will explain to clients uh, pre-litigation, pleadings, the pleading stage of discovery, written discovery, oral discovery, giving them examples of each of these uh, activities, um, expert discovery, trial, really break it down for them um, in, in layman's terms and they will greatly appreciate it and I suggest it is our obligation. Balance expectations. This is a tough one to do early because many of our clients uh, come into the door of our office for the first time uh, wanting millions. They've seen uh, uh, headlines in newspapers, often from the Lovey firm, with uh, millions of dollars uh, in, in jury verdicts. And their case often has no chance of reaching that level of success. It might be a $25,000 case, it might be a $100,000 case, but it's important, at least for me, to not let the client walk away from the first meeting thinking they're gonna make 1.2 million. Wrongful death cases, uh, when you are meeting with your client initially and you are working on a wrongful death case, uh, the first conversation with your client is critical. You have to identify who within the family is legally qualified to be the administrator. So obtain from the client literally a family tree. You want to verify uh, who the dependents are, who the heirs are. You want to consult with wills and estates attorneys. You want to possibly refer out the creation of the estate to an attorney who lives and breathes in uh, probate court. But uh, this is an essential uh, part of the initial client communications in a wrongful death case, obtaining uh, the next of kin. Media issues. Uh, you might have a case, as many of our cases uh, are of media interest, and it's very important to convey to the client immediately to have no contact whatsoever with a journalist. If the journalist calls, you simply instruct your client to give your name and your telephone number to the journalist. And if this is a media case, you must create a media strategy so that you are out in front of any media uh, coverage. Lastly, not everybody's gonna do this, and I'm not saying that you should, but I like maintaining uh, the important line of communication with my clients by giving them my cell phone number. It is draining at times, but the benefits of the client knowing that they can reach out to you at any time is enormously helpful. Similarly, you might need to reach your client sometime when you're out speaking with a witness and you want to have those clear lines of communication open. Next, the retainer agreement and release of medical information. Fairness, once again. Uh, as you know, the standard attorney-client agreement is packed with legalese. I have often seen attorneys sit down with clients 
grow the retainer agreement to the client, give them a brief summary, uh, perhaps in three words, the client signs it, gets a copy, and that's the end of the signing process. And I find that to be unfair. I believe that fairness with regards to the retainer agreement means explaining every element, every detail of the agreement. Explaining attorney's fees. If you have a referring attorney, inform the client as you must under the uh, rules. Um, explain to them exactly what percentage the lead attorney is getting and what percentage the referring attorney is getting. If there are attorney's liens, which there most likely will be in a uh, excessive force case, explain to the client that a lot of money will be grabbed from their ultimate uh, settlement. And uh, you want to point out to them the legal obligations that you have um, in the retainer agreement for the payment of attorney's liens and medical liens. Costs. Uh, most of us are advancing the costs um, of the litigation. We want to make sure that our clients understand that they are paying the costs uh, back to you at the end of the case. I often go so as uh, go as far as explaining the one third, one third, one third uh, fractions that often come up in uh, litigation uh, settlements which is where one third of the um, settlement goes to the client, one third to the attorneys, and one third to medical providers. It doesn't always work out that way, but I bring it up early just so the client can begin to understand uh, the financial arrangements. Lastly, on uh, the retainer agreement and medical information front is the medical information itself. If there is any sign of injury, whether it's a physical injury or if your client expresses um, complaints of psychological injuries and they are going to seek therapy, uh, get a HIPAA compliant authorization signed by your client at that very first meeting. So before I go on to the investigation itself, um, I just want to summarize. Go meet with the client, uh, jump in your car. It can really pay off. I had a, a case that I signed up about a year ago in Wisconsin, and I knew it was gonna be a substantial case. I knew that there were gonna be other lawyers uh, involved uh, trying to get this case. And I jumped in my car and I drove to Wisconsin at a moment's notice, and I met with the entire family. Now it was a wrongful death case, and I sat with six or seven family members. I wasn't sure exactly who was going to be the proper administrator. I signed everybody up to the agreement and I explained to them, I might, I might modify the retainer agreement down the road, but that I needed all of their signatures at this point in time. Um, I've had cases from downstate Illinois where I've, uh, uh, where I've, received a client who lives maybe five hours away. I've made a deal with them, let's meet halfway. Um, I once drove to Lincoln, Illinois, and a great cafe in Lincoln um, that could have held its own in Chicago. Met with a client, they really appreciated um, my effort. So get out there and spend time with your client and explain uh, everything that they need to know about their case. A diligent investigation. Uh, this is the most important part of uh, today's um, presentation, and I think that I'm already behind schedule. So let's move quickly. First of all, why conduct a diligent investigation? First of all, it's required. We have to. Pursuant to federal rules, and if you're in state court, uh, state, state rules of civil procedure, you're required to investigate the facts and the law before you put your signature on any complaint. You can be sanctioned if you fail to investigate. So a requirement, always a good motivator. Second, you, if you are pursuing any preliminary injunctive relief, you cannot start your investigation as you walk to court for the injunctive relief. You're gonna to have to put a lot of uh, efforts and work in uh, 
obtaining key facts and law before you walk into the courtroom. Um, the investigation may inform you uh, what jurisdiction you're gonna file in, state or federal court. And in certain cases, such as in a prison litigation case, if you're suing a, a doctor at a prison, you might want to, as part of your investigation, retain an expert witness, a medical expert, who can give you the um, scenario, the information about the medical injury, the proper treatment, what, what treatment was denied, uh, what standard of care was breached. And um, if, you know, if you're going to hire an expert, you know at some point in time in a case, I recommend you retain them early and uh, get them working for you. Uh, I have probably filed two respondent in discovery cases in 20 years, but I did one about a year ago. It was extremely helpful. I had uh, a number of John Doe defendants, and I just decided to, uh, instead of just naming John Doe's in federal court, I, did I decided to file in state court, identify the proper defendants. I was able to actually accidentally obtain some other information that was served up in, uh, in this respondent and discovery case, and it was very useful. Order medical records immediately. Um, I am confident in, in my clients about 90% of the time. However, I have had clients tell me in the past that they had a broken bone or they had a ruptured disc only to obtain the medical records to find out that no such injury was sustained. So you need to know the facts directly about the uh, damages in your case. A, a private investigator. I highly recommend that you invest in a relationship with a good private investigator and invest in using that investigator on almost every case. I use my private investigator, uh, Lynn Marie Bagley, who is phenomenal. I use her on almost every case. Sometimes it's just uh, a quick background report. Uh, personal or uh, private investigators are able to access a number of databases that we can't access. And for a very small amount of money, your private investigator can give you a 10, 20, or 50 page report uh, packed with information about your client, possibly the defendants, witnesses, locations, um, so do consider um, hiring a private investigator. Your client often has more information than they realize. And this circles back to why you want to spend so much time with your client. You really want to talk through the incident time after time to make sure your client has informed you of every witness um, that they have access to, that they know who was present at the scene. Uh, every document that might be out there in their possession or not, videos, social media. Social media, as you all know, is huge right now. And I'm actually at a bit of a disadvantage because I'm not on social media very much and I'm not on Facebook. But your client likely has uh, a lot of information on social media about their um, incident. Get that from them. And then very importantly, tell them to not say another word anywhere on social media about their case. Um, as you know, uh, the defense attorneys will find that social media, and if there's anything negative in there, you can be sure it will be used against your client. I'd like to actually dispatch my client, make my client become a private investigator and make inroads on the investigation that you or your investigator probably cannot make. Um, you want your client's help uh, with identifying the witnesses, and then you got to go out there and meet with the witness. Uh, you can have your investigator meet with them. You could. I know many attorneys, uh, many more experienced and uh, more intelligent attorneys on this webinar who will often lock witnesses in early before litigation, uh, lock them into written statements. An investigator can help with that. Um, and again, when you meet with a witness, the same rules apply. You have to build trust with this witness. Many of them will likely be afraid of uh, informing on the police. Uh, you might want to bring your client with you 
as you uh, beseech them to do justice. You need their help to obtain justice. Spend time with your witnesses. Go to the scene. This is probably my most important message today. Go to the scene immediately after you get the case. Go there more than once. Speak to neighbors. Speak to witnesses. Look around for pod cameras. Become a private investigator yourself. Uh, whether you want to be Colombo or Olivia Benson, um, put on your private eye hat and walk the streets. I had a shooting case in Englewood about 10 years ago, and it was a nice summer day. And I walked up and down a street in Englewood, and it was one of my favorite days uh, in my five and a half decades in Chicago because almost every other resident in Englewood during the summer invited me into their home for coffee, lemonade, or water. I guarantee you if I would canvas homes in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, not a single person uh, would open their door uh, for long and they certainly would not be offering uh, coffee. Um, this is the fun part of our work where we get to go out and uh, try to heal the city even by uh, bringing, um, in my case, a north side uh, white guy to the south side and uh, learn that we are all the same and deserving of respect. So go to the scene and go often. Letters of pres preservation. I have provided a sample letter of pre preservation, but after I've gone to a scene and I see that there's a business with a video camera, I will race back to my office and send a letter of preservation. Uh, let's see if we can pull a uh, sample letter up. Here's one to um, the famously named John Kennedy. I'm explaining to him that I've been retained by the plaintiff to investigate a shooting on a certain date at a certain location. I asked that um, the I asked that Mr. Kennedy hold care for, maintain, preserve, and do not alter any evidence whatsoever uh, for the six hour period before and after the incident. And I informed them in my letter that it is our intention to use these items at trial and their failure to preserve the evidence could result in a cause of action for spoliation of evidence. Uh, so that's a that's a terrific um, uh, instrument, uh, the letter of preservation. Excuse me while I try to figure out PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, next we have uh, why why is an, an investigation important? Well, in many, many cases, uh, and this is, was an issue on the NPAP listserv last couple of days ago, for instance, in the Federal Tort Claim Act action, uh, I had a case against uh, ICE several years ago. And for these FTCA claims, you must file an administrative claim before you file suit or file a Bivens action. So you must conduct an investigation uh, before suit because it's required. Similarly, if you had a small personal injury case uh, against the CTA, it's a similar type of requirement where you have to give the CTA notice of a personal injury case um, prior to filing suit. So uh, do check notice requirements, pre-suit -pre notice requirements uh, before you take on uh, any case. FOIAs, uh, issue FOIAs until you have carpal tunnel. Uh, we live in dark times, ladies and gentlemen, with regards to transparency and democracy and oversight, uh, oversight officials being fired left and right. Uh, we still uh, have a strong FOIA. Um, and um, I have provided a sample of rather crude um, uh, FOIA request uh, with the materials that just shows you how simple just a few words on a freedom freedom of information request uh, four sentences uh, got me a tremendous amount of information um, in a case 
uh, every agency has their own FOIA forms. Uh, use them and um, you will benefit greatly. I'll be better at PowerPoint for my next webinar, I promise. Um, Criminal cases. Uh, it is extremely helpful when you sign up a case to go to 26, 26 and Calg or uh, documents are now accessible online uh, for state court in Cook County. Go take a look at the file. Uh, look at the criminal defense attorney's file. Uh, it's a great source for information. Also, uh, part of your diligent investigation, you must pursuant to the rules and pursuant to your interest in being well organized and, and, and benefiting from your investigation, keep the product of your investigation extremely well organized. This applies to electronic information on hard drives and backed up on thumb drives. Uh, it goes to multiple copies of uh, documents. Be well organized. Um, Number 17, this one item can be a webinar on its own, but most of your work uh, as part of your investigation will be privileged uh, work product. However, a good defense attorney at times will try to breach uh, the shield of the work product doctrine. Uh, read up a little bit on this area uh, when you have a chance and educate yourself on what steps you can take to preserve the work product doctrine so it doesn't get lost. And I reference uh, an article there that was helpful to me. Finally, conduct a diligent information, I'm sorry, conduct a diligent search into defendants' uh, litigation and disciplinary histories. We have in our city two incredible, inspiring civil rights leaders. Uh, Professor Craig Futterman and Jamie Calvin. And thanks to their work and the work of many, many others on their teams and on other teams, we now have uh, enormously valuable databases where you can look up uh, Chicago police officers and uh, find out details about their um, disciplinary history. I must tell you that while the City of Chicago Inspector General's office has a database online. Uh, I have found discrepancies. Uh, here is the Inspector General's uh, website. I have found that the Invisible Institute's uh, Citizens Police Data Project, their database is often more accurate than the city's. And uh, that's a phenomenal, phenomenal accomplishment and a great access, uh, a great tool for us as we litigate. Um, so that concludes uh, diligent investigation, and I believe I'm doing pretty well on time. I will, uh, if, I, if I end early, I will likely just expand the question and answer uh, discussion format. Identifying proper defendants. I uh, am pretty good about not losing sleep over statute, statutes of limitations. Just the basic fact that an incident took place on June 1st, 2020, I know I have to file by June 1st, 2021 or 2022, depending on the applicable statute of limitations. And I document, uh, I calendar my, my diary and put 17,000 reminders and make sure I don't miss a, a statute. But what's a little more difficult is you file your case, but what if you haven't named all of the, uh, in police misconduct cases, what if you haven't named all of the officers? And this is what uh, drives me crazy sometimes and makes me nervous. Um, one really good thing to do to make sure you have named all of the um, tort feasors is to file your action as soon as possible. Because as soon as you file your case, uh, you will get um, initial discovery, you'll engage in discovery, and if there is another tortfeasor, 
hopefully you'll you'll learn the identity of that person uh, before the statute. But you can't risk it, so you have to work diligently through many of the um, many of the actions we discussed earlier about identifying witnesses, identifying documents. Um, but this is a critically uh, important aspect of uh, litigation and of uh, um, getting sleep at night. I want to just go to a redacted uh, CPD arrest report. And this is a very simple example I'm going to give you, but I'm going to show you who the obvious uh, tort feasors are in, in this case. So we have an arrest report, and this is a, a standard Chicago Police Department arrest report. It's three pages. And it has the date of the incident. It has the charges against my client of robbery, a warrant. We go to page two. We learn about the victim. Um, and then critically, we get the narrative, which is which officer has done what. Uh, officers uh, will often describe most of their conduct and who was involved. They may not say exactly what was done, but they'll say what officers uh, were present. Um, in the narrative, you want to be very careful, uh, making sure you obtain all the names from the narrative. Critically on page three, you have a testing officer and then you have two arresting officers. If your client tells you that there were two officers present at the scene who falsely arrested her, uh, these are your two officers, uh, Jay War and Bon Giovanni. Um, so life is never quite this simple though. Uh, the identities of tort feasors can often be uh, a much more complicated task um, than the simple case I demonstrated. So here we are at the end of our discussion. I am going to pull up the webinar um, program and see if I can start uh, responding to any questions that have been um, raised at this time. I'm actually having trouble, I'll reach out to my organizers, I'm having trouble reading uh, any questions that have been posted. It might be because no questions have been posted yet. Which is uh, I, can, I can actually read some if you can't find them. They should be in the questions tab, but I can read some of them that have been submitted. And you guys can keep asking questions as, as we're answering them. Um, one of them, Timothy Black asks, is there a good database of experts to choose from or is a quick Google search the best way to choose an expert? My recommendation on experts is to utilize the listserv, um, the NPAP listserv, and to utilize uh, our amazing uh, civil rights community here in Chicago to inform you on what experts to use and importantly, what experts not to use. I uh, am not a fan of going through um, those books of 300 pages of experts from various fields. Um, I'm not a fan necessarily of using the various companies that uh, facilitate experts. I like to obtain experts from my colleagues and I like to obtain experts through case law uh, that I have read over the years, uh, which, which experts have been effective. Uh, there, this one was answered uh, by Dan, but maybe you can have your own perspective on this. So Maria asked on Saturday during a protest, police officer took her camera away and never gave it back, and she was filming for journalistic purposes and filed a complaint. What can they do next? Well, um, this is an egregious violation of their rights, and they should immediately contact an attorney, um, the ACLU. Um, and get representation. Uh, there's a slippery slope right now uh, going on of attacks on journalists. 
and the only way to uh, reverse that is to stand up and fight. So this person needs a lawyer. I volunteer if they have, uh, if, if they're not able to find somebody. <laughs> Uh, an audience member is also asking if they can get a copy of this presentation as well. I think, Dan, we can share that out after the presentation. Um, that should be it in terms of questions, unless anyone else has any that they're asking about. Um, there are some that are uh, coming up, can you explain how you cover the risks that a non-prevailing plaintiff will be responsible for costs with clients when discussing a uh, retainer agreement? Yes, very good question. My understanding is that if the plaintiff loses his or her case, the plaintiff is responsible for the defendant's costs, all costs, uh, litigation-oriented costs that the defendants have incurred throughout litigation. Uh, it is useful and uh, relieving to the heart to inform them that they will not be responsible for defense attorneys' attorneys' fees, um, just costs. Uh, can you explain or expand upon about locking witnesses into their statements early? Yes. Um, and this is a time when I wish we were in a conference room because, again, there are so many very experienced uh, police misconduct litigators in this webinar. But many attorneys I know, as soon as they find a witness, and if the case has not been filed yet, they will send a private investigator out and lock that witness in to, uh, just like in a deposition, to a recorded uh, transcript that will be typed up that says exactly what that witness uh, saw, where they were standing, uh, any biases that might be uh, involved. And the point is, is that you're doing it for several reasons. One, if you don't want that witness to disappear, um, you don't know if the witness is gonna be available at the time of trial, if they might move to another state. Um, there may be problems admitting the statement, but um, you, you want to have them locked in. You might also have a witness who changes his or her story, and the change may not be advantageous to your case. Uh, having, a, having a witness locked in uh, written testimony um, denies them the ability later to change their story. Uh, can you give us uh, best practices for ensuring that uh, pre-suit investigation remains a work product? Um, some have a basic understanding of the doctrine, but what steps do you take? Well, I think the most important thing that I had in mind when I included that element was, um, for instance, if you meet with a witness, uh, and I told you earlier that there are advantages to uh, having your client with you. Um, but you have to be careful when you're speaking with your client in front of the witness. Uh, you have lost attorney-client privilege. Uh, same goes for distribution of reports, uh, talking about reports with uh, that you've uncovered. If you've, if you've uh, acquired a report and it's part of your investigation, great. But if you start distributing this report sharing it, um, using the report in ways that go beyond uh, your particular use for litigation. Um, this investigation document that you that you recovered or you found uh, will, will possibly not be protected. Uh, this one's from Louis Meyer or Louis Meyer, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, if you know the attorney that represent the police department or county, do you reach out to them to see if you can get documents or reports prior to filing suit. Uh, hey, Lewis, uh, this just happened to me recently. I had a case uh, just when the pandemic uh, stay-at-home stay orders uh, kicked in, and my client insisted that while I was naming four police officers to file this complaint at law, that there was actually a fifth officer. 
And I reached out to the Cook County State's Attorney, a very, very high supervisor who uh, does not like me uh, right now, which is fine. But um, I bothered the supervisor uh, with letters, uh, faxes, phone calls to obtain as many documents as I could um, before filing suit because I had to get this right and the statute of limitations was coming up. So yes, um, I often will reach out to defendants uh, before filing suit for documentation. And most of the time, not always, but quite a bit of the time, uh, you can get limited materials, uh, especially pursuant to FOIA. But uh, sometimes the defense attorneys will know that it's subject to FOIA and will just hand them over. They know that they have to stand in front of a judge uh, sometime soon in your case, and they don't want to appear uh, necessarily as being uh, obstructionist. Uh, <clears throat> this one's from uh, James uh, Dolber. I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> butchering your last name. Uh, when physical evidence is in police custody, but belongs to the client or a state representative and the police offer to let you or your client pick up the property, is there anything that you should do to preserve uh, the integrity or usefulness of that evidence? Well, it's a great question. I think that um, you want to make sure, just like in a criminal case, that the piece of evidence is not being passed from hand to hand, location to location. So uh, when I was mentioning earlier about uh, protecting um, and organizing all of your evidence, uh, this is a perfect example where you want to take an evidence, you want to be able to, you know, bring it right back to your office, put it in an envelope or a box, mark it evidence, put the date on it that you sealed it. Uh, it's not it's not quite the high same high standard as in a criminal case, but uh, very good practice. This one's from uh, Henry Rose. Could you explain more about the impact listserv and how to access it? The oh the NPAP. Uh, the serv absolutely. Uh, NPAP is an amazing organization, the National Police Accountability Project. It is a national organization uh, run by the National Lawyers Guild. And in the city of Chicago, we have what's called the Chicago chapter of NPAP. And uh, we have a remarkable community of civil rights lawyers in Chicago. And the uh, Chicago NPAP listserv is a treasure. Um, so if uh, you want to, whoever wants to email me, I can get you on the listserv. But essentially, you want to reach out to Ken Flaxman or Joel Flaxman, and uh, they will get you on um, if you fit uh, the criteria of being a advocate for civil rights on the plaintiff side. Uh, this one's from David Serta. How uh, responsive is the city to responding to your FOIA requests? Uh, what do you typically receive in response? Do they give you supplemental reports and do they heavily redact documents? Well, hi, David. And uh, David is one of the people who inspired me to get into the field of uh, civil rights. Um, David uh, knows this area of law much better than me, but I will say that um, FOIA is a great tool for getting a lot of information, but I think you're hinting accurately, David, it's problematic. You're gonna get a lot of redacted documents. There are gonna be a lot of supplementary reports that the city should be supplementing in response to your original FOIA, and they won't. So you really have to stay on top of them. Um, if the question, David, regards uh, COVID and, and FOIA during COVID, um, I've been getting uh, really fast responses from a lot of government agencies uh, during, during the pandemic. So um, I know there was talk earlier on of municipalities delaying responses, which was a scary, a scary scenario to not have transparency, not to have oversight during a pandemic, but uh, in my limited experience in the last few months, uh, FOIAs are being processed pretty quickly. But you have to stay on them. You have to send supplemental FOIAs to make sure you get supplementary documents. 
Uh, here's another question. What do you do when you don't have time for a respondent in discovery suit in state court prior to a federal SOL? Uh, are you trying to identify defendants if you want to file your, your case in federal court? Do you file both? Well, this is a very complicated, good question. Um, you know, if you do not know the identities of the officers um, in federal court, I've had a lot of success naming, uh, you know, so the case will be titled John Smith versus John Doe 1 and Jane Doe 2. And you file the complaint and then you immediately file an emergency motion uh, to compel limited uh, discovery um, to obtain every shred of paper, uh, every piece of evidence necessary so that you can name the tort feasors. Um, get into court quickly and get that information. Uh, I Just as from a practicing point of view, I would recommend to people to be careful not to take cases that are very close to the termination um, of, of, the, of the statute of limitations because it's, it, it strikes me as a recipe for disaster. Uh, you may not be able to conduct a proper investigation to name all the officers in time uh, for the statute. Uh, if you do want to take the case anyway, I would absolutely put a clause in your attorney-client agreement and have your client initial that paragraph saying that you warn them that by coming onto the case so late, uh, you may not be able to identify all tort users and get them to sign up on that. But uh, I usually won't take the case in the last three months of the two-year statute or one-year statute. This one asks, uh, what are the ethical issues when a potential turns into a potential defendant? I'm sorry, a potential plaintiff becomes a potential defendant? I didn't quite get that. Uh, I'm not quite sure. They, it, it just says potential, turns into a potential defendant. Mm. Uh, perhaps it's, uh, they missed a word there. Um, I, if that's not really too clear, there's also another question asking, do you write a demand letter prior to filing suit? It depends on the defendant. Uh, when you have cases against the city of Chicago, uh, it will be, I suggest, a complete waste of time to write a demand letter before suit. I don't think, you know, I could count on one hand in 20 years the number of times I have been able to settle a case without filing suit. And it's not really an attack. I don't mean this is an attack on the city. It's just that the city usually likes to have the full tools of uh, federal rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence to really uncover what happened and, and to defend the city properly. Um, however, uh, if I, in uh, my in investigation, uh, pre-litigation investigation, find an officer, and this happened to me about a year ago, who was just so very corrupt, and I was able to connect him to another uh, officer with the uh, troubling history, um, I wrote a letter to the city I raised, I attached, by the way, I always attach a draft complainant law. And I've said, here's uh, the case that I'm going to file in X number of days. If you want to talk about settlement, uh, give me a call. Otherwise, we'll just proceed to litigation. Um, but with smaller towns and some collar counties, um, there are opportunities to settle uh, before filing suit. And actually, if you think a lawsuit might be damaging uh, to the defendants, uh, it, qu it could give you quite a bit of leverage to raise uh, possibility of a settlement before a suit and say, hey, let's, let's address this uh, before I file a suit so it doesn't go so wildly public. Um, be careful, though, ethically. I always wrestle with those because you don't want to be involved in, uh, in, in covering something up. So if there's a injustice, if there's an injustice that has been committed um, to your client, um, it, 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 you should make sure that the news gets out somehow. I'm not asking you to violate any um, confidentiality agreements at all, but there's a balance there about uh, maintaining uh, 
on the confidentiality of the settlement, but also making sure the public has access to um, the wrongdoing, potentially, of a, of a government official who answers to the people. So the previous question that we weren't sure was actually sent again and clarified. Let me pull that one up. Uh, so they asked, what are the ethical issues about contacting potential defendants as part of pre-litigation investigation? Oh, well, um, I highly recommend that you do not contact any defendant police officers uh, before filing suit. Uh, most importantly, um, they're not going to give you anything, um, and it could be looked at as uh, harassment, perhaps. Um, whatever goals you have in mind in reaching out to a defendant pre-litigation, um, I would suggest that there are other ways to get that information. This one's from uh, Jordan Marsh. When you draft the demand letter, how much detail do you include and how much do you hold back so that you're not providing the defendants too much information regarding your case? Jordan, another another highly experienced, talented attorney on the webinar. Uh, um, uh, uh, could you read back the question? I just want to hear one thing again. Sure. Uh, when you draft a demand letter, how much detail do you include and how much do you hold back so that you're not providing the defendant too much information regarding your case? Yeah, it was the hold back part that I, I thought was in there. You know, Jordan, um, probably like I used to do when you were on the other side of the aisle, I often just call defense counsel and ask them what they want. Um, do they want a two sentence letter uh, with a demand? or do they want a three-page letter uh, outlining uh, all of the details of the facts and the and liability and damages? Um, and uh, sometimes the uh, defense attorney will say, well, I just need a one-line amount. Another defense attorney might say, well, I've got to go to my county board and convince them. Uh, so arm your, you know, put as much uh, information in the, in the letter that will help me help you. Uh, you have to be a little careful of that, not to give away too many um, gems in case the case does not settle. But I usually go by uh, defense attorney's guidance, and most of them will tell you what they need. Uh, this one asks, any general tips for dealing with press early in a case, particularly while your access to evidence might be limited or your plaintiff uh, deceased? This question could include client management. Well, um, the media is at times a very helpful ally uh, to a plaintiff's attorney. If you're having trouble getting uh, information and documentation, uh, there are advantages to taking a story public and uh, watch your phone uh, start ringing. Um, with calls from witnesses who read the article, saw the broadcast. So uh, there are advantages at times to bringing the media involved. Um, I'm not really a big media uh, practitioner. Um, I certainly have had uh, stories uh, written up about my cases. I've certainly had some TV broadcast news about my cases. Um, I tend to lie, I, I tend to lay pretty low. Uh, with regards to media, um, unless I really need it um, for information like the, like the person uh, asked in the question. Um, or going back to my earlier point, if there's public interest uh, at issue, um, for instance, when I was prosecuting uh, these uh, recent police officers, Elizondo and Salgado, who turns out were running a drug conspiracy operation themselves. Uh, when I had clients who were directly uh, wronged by these officers, I felt it was in the public interest um, to go to the media. Um, so it, it's really an individual call case by case. There are books, volumes, books, articles written about media and litigation. Uh, very useful to read about this issue and see how the media can help you 
and how it can hurt you. Uh, this one's not a question, more of a compliment. She said, uh, Caroline said she's not a lawyer, just interested in civil rights, but this was helpful even for uh, her as a layperson. So she just wanted to uh, thank you for that. Um, this question asks, do you address tax issues up front in all cases? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, do you address tax issues up front in all cases? So this is a hot issue um, in our plaintiff's bar, taxes, taxes on proceeds. And I uh, take an approach where I run and hide. I put on my retainer agreement uh, and I put on my settlement statement at the end of the case that I am not capable and I am not going to give any tax advice to my client. Uh, this is a really difficult area of law. It used to be kind of a straightforward, uh, if it's an injury, physical injury or psychological injury from an excessive force case or, or false arrest case, uh, it's, it's, it was kind of likely that um, you would not be taxed because it's compensation for a physical or emotional injury. Um, but that formula no longer applies. The IRS code is highly detailed. And I just uh, believe that the answer is to case specific, case to case. So I just tell my clients to consult with, um, you know, their, their, their CPA. Um, okay. Uh, I think that does it for uh, questions. Uh, David, did you have, oh, hold on, there's another one that popped up. Uh, do you ever seek third party, uh, I believe it's financing of your cases? Hmm. Um, I would wish I could say yes, but uh, no, I, I usually don't. Um, but I'm just a uh, sole practitioner uh, worried about getting into debt. However, um, I could see the need, you know, if you have a really good prison litigation case uh, for denial of medical care and you really need a doctor's affidavit um, to prove medical negligence, as well as the greater Section 1983 denial of, of medical care, um, it's expensive. And if you have to take a loan for that, um, just be careful of the interest rates because lawyers can be subjected to some of these outrageous interest rates that uh, a lot of plaintiffs get uh, when they get loans on their litigation upwards of 30 40 50 percent uh, interest rates so um go carefully on on the borrowing but i can certainly see uh, it having value uh okay uh david did you have any uh closing thoughts or statements before we uh, I do, do, um, as we live in such a difficult time in our country's history, I just wanted to send everybody off with some uh, touchy feely remarks. Oh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for doing justice in whatever work you do as a lawyer or a non lawyer. Uh, please stay healthy and safe during this time of pandemic and demonstrations and keep other people uh, safe also. Um, it's a lifelong responsibility to keep other people safe, but especially now with regards to wearing masks, not just for your own health, but for others. And given uh, the blood on the streets of America, uh, we all must stand up against racism. Racism is at the core of everything happening uh, right now in our country, even Corona with regards to the racially unequal uh, effects Corona has had on minorities. Um, but during this time, silence is no longer an option. Uh, you've probably seen the signs uh, that I support, uh, especially when they're held by white people. Uh, silence is actually violence now. Uh, with that, um, Thank you so much for participating. Call Wait, me David, before we close it out, I have one more question. I'm um, first. I want to thank everyone from for coming. 
Um, really appreciate all the questions and the, the conversation and the presentation. Um, but I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the question about um, respondents in discovery and statute of limitation issues and then the last three months of a, of a case. And this is something that uh, sort of throws my head for loops um, in terms of when notice would be given to a potential DOE defendant based on naming the city as a party. Could you expound upon um, your caution there uh, a little more? Well, uh, basically, it's very hard to name a John Doe. You, you really, the rule really is you must name the tortfeasor by name by the statute of limitations. Now, there is case law, and I might be needing it soon in a case, there is case law that if the plaintiff could not possibly have found out the identity of this tortfeasor, and if the other defendants know the identity of that tortfeasor and knew and know that that tortfeasor should be a defendant in the case, um, there may be uh, ways of bringing in that individual um, as a defendant um, past the two-year statute of limitations. Um, but it's risky, and I, I would do everything I could to try to identify the defendant before um, before you file suit with response to in response to the respondent and discovery the state action it's very important to know that it's not an opportunity to start finding videos and witnesses and all sorts of information about your case there's a singular purpose to the respondent and discovery which is to find out who the proper parties are and um Really, uh, there are almost always other ways to find out uh, without going to a respondent and discovery case, but it is a tool. Uh, with regards to your last point about the three months, I just worry about my malpractice insurance when it comes to the last few months. I just worry about getting in trouble for not uh, being able to fully investigate and identify the tort abusers um, in time for the statute of limitations. And therefore, as a rule, I usually just don't take cases um, the last three months of the uh, tolling provision. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks, Dan, for that question. Um, that does it for today's presentation. Uh, it, this presentation was recorded, so if there's anything that you guys maybe uh, wanted to go over again or, you know, pause the video and, and, you know, look at the presentation, we will have it uploaded to YouTube uh, by tomorrow. Um, and we'll also have a follow-up email as well that will include uh, the link. So with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.